Welcome back to our second last edition of the Municipal Month on Cross-Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our guest onto the show today. He is the current mayor for St. John's, Newfoundland. His worship, Danny Breen, is with us. Mayor Breen, welcome to the show. I'm pleased and honored to have you on. Oh, good morning, Chris. Thank you for the invitation. Join me. Um, my first question that I've asked every single politician on this show is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, your uh, mayor? Well, I, I think a lot of it came from my upbringing. Uh, my father was a, a, a longshoreman and a, later in his life, a, a union leader. Um, and uh, he was always involved in the community, whether it was running a, a soccer team in the orphanage that he, that he grew up in or... Uh, uh, and always encouraged us to get involved. And uh, I've been involved my whole life uh, for, through student councils, uh, student council at the university, president of minor hockey, uh, involved in the Heart and Stroke Foundation, just anything I could chip in and help with, I always did. And uh, I think I just saw this as another level that I could uh, put my involvement in. You chose municipal politics to get involved in. In 20, uh, 2009 was when you were first elected to St. John's Council as a councillor. What was it in 2009 that made you make the final plunge and say, OK, now is the time to get involved in municipal politics? You know, I was I was 47 years old. I, uh, my career had gone well. I had lived uh, away uh, for a number of years, came back in 1999 uh, to St. John's. Um, and uh, just saw that it was a good opportunity for me personally and, uh, and professionally to, to do this. So uh, my family, very supportive, my wife and, and two daughters. So uh, I decided to give it a try. And uh, in 2009, I got elected. Um, and in 2013, I was reelected uh, by acclamation. So I've, I, I had good uh, eight years on council and then decided that it was time to uh, move up. And before we talk about moving up, I want to I want to stick to that 2009 election for a second, if you don't mind. Was there an issue that was pressing to you that you said, OK, I feel like my voice on council would be the best to advocate for issue X or issue Y? Because I always find it fascinating when I talk to municipal politicians about the issue that got them involved, whether it be a pothole or the way they see the budget being uh, deliberated. What was your issue? I don't think there was one real burning issue, but I think one thing that uh, with that I was very involved in was sports, and I saw uh, sports and athletics as uh, not getting uh, the attention uh, at the time that they uh, that they deserved. Uh, so that was uh, a part of it for me. Uh, financial management, I've, uh, I'm, I was very interested in in, uh, in in good fiscal management of the city, so I felt I had something to offer in that regards. And sometimes just some common sense uh, input into decisions that are being made. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm, you know, sometimes they're tough decisions, uh, but if, uh, if, if you communicate them properly and you put the proper thought in the beginning, then uh, they'll make sense to people. I want to I want to uh, ask this question because I, the common sense part really tickled my funny bone there for a second. Um, Getting involved in municipal politics is a unique beast in itself because you are the local councillor for your community and you see the people you represent at the grocery store, whether provincially or federally, you're going off to Ottawa. Uh, provincially, it may be a little bit different in Newfoundland because it, you're in St. John's and that's where the capital is. But you know these people that you're making decisions based on their day-to-day -day lives, their garbage pickup, their water, their financial uh, constraints that they may have at tax time. Was there a concern getting into politics, especially at a municipal level for you, that the decisions that I'm going to be making are going to affect the hockey league that I was uh, the president of, the neighbor that I have? Was there any concern about, around that when you first got uh, involved? Yeah, so I had some experience. My brother had been uh, had been a city councillor for a term uh, previous to me, so he understood, and I saw what he uh, what he dealt with. So I learned a lot uh, um, a lot from that. So that was uh, some grounding that I had. Uh, I did you, you know, feel a weight on your shoulders? 
Yeah, you know what? I've, I've, I, you know, you take your job serious, and you uh, you take uh, what you're doing as you're affecting people, and rather direct impact on people. We have the most impact of all three levels of government. I'll, I always tell uh, uh, people that the federal government has the money, the province has the jurisdiction, and the city has the problem. And that's the way you approach these things. And, uh, you know, because of our fiscal arrangement where we rely uh, so much on property taxes, uh, that we have to work in concert with the community and other levels of government, and we have to develop partnerships. So that's really the key to, to the operation of the municipal government. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. We're also closest to the people, like you said. So uh, when people talk about consultations, I talk about my Costco consultation. When I go to Costco, I get every type of question, comment, applause, criticism, everything comes at you. So uh, it's all part of it. And I think it's what makes it a more enjoyable level of politics. Have you learned to balance? Because I can imagine going to your local grocery store or going to Costco or going to fill up your uh, tank of gas or going to the post office is no longer just a luxury that most people have because you are always on as a mayor, as a counselor, as a local official. Have you learned the balance of saying, okay, I would love to talk to you about this today, but here's my card, call me tomorrow. Or are you one of those politicians, those mayors that will say, let's talk about it now, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we, we'll, we'll continue the conversation <laughs> after if we need to. My wife has learned how to balance it by taking the cart and leaving me at the front door and then picking me up at the, at the checkout. So, uh, you know, it's all part of it, right? Like people uh, want to talk about it and they're genuinely, it's an issue that's important to them. Uh, and I think sometimes in politics, we don't fully appreciate that at that moment in time, that is a very important issue to that person. And uh, it, it needs to be, uh, they need to, to know that you're concerned about their issue and you're, uh, and you want to be able to help them. So how do you balance that part of it? Because everyone's issue is the most important to them. But as an elected official, especially on a municipal level, you have to balance the need of the many against the needs of the few, to quote, to quote Star Trek here, um, because you have to look at the best of what your city is going to be moving forward. It's great to talk about the pothole or the sidewalk or that water issue that someone may have, but you have to look at it as a big picture. How have you been able to balance that? Because I can imagine you seem like a personable guy in our first 10 minutes of conversation so far. You, 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 it seems like you might have a hard time saying no to people saying, I would love to deal with this, but right now this isn't our pressing issue for the city. This is. Yeah, and a lot of that comes from listening to people and understanding what the pressing issues are and what is pressing pressing to them. But you, the word you used there was balance. And the, uh, a big part of this job is is balancing. You balance priorities, you balance uh, expectations, you, uh, you balance, uh, you look at what you want to do into the future. You look at your strategic plan and, and what's your best way to do that because you can't do everything at once. I mean, uh, you know, for example, people will complain about the state of a road. And so in, when once you go through your, your annual uh, budget and you make the road improvements, they complain about the traffic delays from the, from the, from the uh, improvements that are being made. So, you know, it's hard to explain to people. You just don't go out and buy a piece of road and go in and lay it down. It's, it's a construction project. So those things... Uh, are always are always a challenge. Uh, well, another one that we that we get sometimes is painting lines on the road, and so we uh, we get complaints. Lines aren't down, and then when we're out painting them, uh, then we get complaints that the traffic's being tied up because we're painting the lines. So it's it's again uh, everybody has a different a different perspective, and sometimes you uh, you you just have to do what you have to do and uh, try to explain it the best you can to people. Are people open to communication in St. John's? Do people listen to what you are talking about? And I say that with respect because I've asked this to all mayors and counselors who've been on the show because I used to be a communications and marketing for a small community in Northern Alberta. And I can tell you, you can communicate as much as you want every avenue, but there's going to be that one person who, no matter how well you communicate, will say, I didn't hear it. I didn't get the memo. So you're not doing an effective job. Do people understand that you can only do as much as you possibly can in the city of St. John's? 
Yeah, I, th I think they do generally, and, and by and large. I mean, there's extremes on both sides of it. There's people that don't really care and don't listen to anything. And then there's people that are hanging on every word uh, that that said. Uh, but, you know, generally, by and large, Newfoundlanders are very interested in politics. They're interested in public uh, service. And they pay attention to what's going on around them. And uh, many, many of the emails that I get are, are very insightful into, um, uh, in, into the issue. And they're also open to hearing your explanation for it and appreciate the fact that you uh, took the time to give them an explanation. Uh, social media has changed a bit of that. Uh, and it's uh, become a bit more uh, ready fire aim when it comes to uh, uh, complaining and, and criticism. But, um, but you have to manage that. But, you pay uh, attention to the social uh, media chatter? It's hard not to, uh, you know, because you you want to see what's on the go, but at the same time, you have to take it into uh, uh, for what it is. You know, one of my one of my rules is that I'll reply once uh, if the person comes back, say, "Listen, give me a call or or send me an email. Um, we can have a chat about this." But, but you know, what you have to avoid in social media is the piling on that happens, and uh, you know that's uh, and unfortunately has deterred a lot of people from participating in social media. In 2017, you decided after two terms as councillor, you were going to step up and run for mayor of uh, the city of St. John's. This is your second term. In 2021, you were acclaimed as mayor. So congratulations on your reelection. Mm -hmm. What was the decision on moving up in the council? Was there a issue that you wanted to advocate for or you just thought it was a progressive stepping stone for yourself? Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, that really in, in my two terms, I always, I always thought that in politics, uh, after a couple of terms, two or three terms, you're, you know, you either need to move, move one way or the other uh, because it's... Uh, uh, you 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 know you do need to uh, to refresh uh, so to speak. So I thought it was time that I was going to make a make a change or um, uh, or leave. And I I really I I, I love the job as mayor. I uh, it's challenging. I've had uh, an interesting uh, five years between snowstorms and and the pandemic. So it's uh, been like no other. Um, but also, we're the capital city of the province, and uh, we're the oldest city in North America. Uh, we have uh, so many uh, beautiful and wonderful things here, and we're and the people being at the top of that list. So it's a privilege being the mayor, and it's something that uh, that I'm really enjoying. I want, I want to talk about the pandemic because you opened Pandora's box, so I want to play in it for a few seconds here. Um, how did your city handle the pandemic uh, while we are on the other side of it, it seems like things are, uh, uh, the restrictions of travel are gone. Uh, how did the people of St. John's handle the pandemic? Well, I, I think they did uh, very well. And I think that uh, we all uh, had had one common uh, approach and that's uh, listen to the best medical evidence that you get, uh, follow that and uh, you're pretty much gonna be on the right track. Uh, we had, uh, challenges. Uh, we, we dealt with the challenges that came about. Uh, we took the opportunity to do what we could to help uh, people, help businesses get through it. One of the things we did here is we introduced a pedestrian mall uh, in downtown on Water Street or Main Street in the city. Um, and so we closed it down for in 2020 for um, uh, from Canada Day to Labor Day, uh, allowed uh, bars and restaurants to put decks outside uh, had to close the vehicle traffic, and it was a smashing success. And we've done it each year since. So uh, what it did at the time is it gave the bars and restaurants excess extra capacity, so uh, they could make up some of their lost revenue. Uh, but at the same time, it got people out and got people becoming part of something, and uh, people enjoyed it. And uh, we uh, we one of the best things uh, that we did during the pandemic. I want to turn to the city of St. John's now. And before I start this segment of the conversation, I want to preface, preempt this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a, a conversation between all of council. This is his opinion. And I'm just saying that because it, it, I'm going to be asking him some pointed opinion questions, not decisions based on the city. Yeah. And the first one I want to ask uh, your worship is this. 
what is the biggest issue facing the city of St. John's today, in your opinion? Well, I, I think we have a lot of uh, a lot of challenges ahead of us. But well, with every challenge, uh, there there lies an opportunity. Um, we have uh, an aging population here. Uh, we have um, uh, we, we we have the need to expand. Uh, economic development is a key uh, a key part of uh, what we need to do. And uh, our fiscal arrangement uh, in terms of taxation. 75% of our uh, revenue comes from, uh, from, ta from property taxes. Uh, property taxes that are actually regressive. They don't reflect people's op uh, ability to pay. They reflect the value of their property. Uh, so, it, you know, with those are, are some of the major challenges. Uh, we also have a, a, a unique situation in that we have uh, we're a population of 108,000 people, but in the region, there's about 220,000. So we're providing regional services, uh, fire department, water system, wastewater system, uh, and a landfill that um, services other, other communities too on a cost recovery basis. So uh, we're, we're a big city, but a small city in, uh, in resources. So um it's it that's a that's a challenge for us as well so i i guess the million dollar question to follow up on that is to start with the economic development side of this because i think a lot of communities and a lot of cities and municipalities are facing that issue right now because they saw what happened in the last three years with the pandemic things shut down uh we are slowly getting back to quote unquote normal and People are looking to diversify because we all worked from home for the last few years. We tried to get out, but it didn't happen. What is the city doing and what are you doing to help attract new uh, economic drivers to the community? Because you are not the only uh, mayor who has said economic development is a big issue. So how do you uh, fight? And I say that with respect mm -hmm. with other communities across Canada who are facing the exact same issue. Yeah. So look, we we our uh, our province, uh, uh, the history of our province economically has been based on the ocean industries, uh, fishing, uh, shipping, uh, and the oil industry uh, in in later years, um, and we see that uh, that continuing. We see that as our strength. Uh, we have a university that's world renowned in in the ocean research. Uh, and, you know, if you're going to be testing things in harsh weather conditions, Newfoundland's a great place to do it. Uh, so, uh, you know, so we, that's really important to us. So we want to grow that and use that as leverage in terms of economic development. We have a very strong startup uh, tech sector here. Uh, we've had some great successes. Companies like Verifin and, uh, and, and others have uh, been uh, international successes. And uh, we want to be able to, to encourage that. The other thing that we have going for us is our creativity. We, uh, we have an arts community that, uh, that is uh, just phenomenal. Uh, we have so many celebrated national um, uh, musicians, artists, actors, uh, comedians, comedians <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. And, uh, and, and the other thing that we do is we host people. We're very welcoming. We're, we we so tourism is a big part of our of our industry as well. So it's multifaceted, uh, but uh, we we feel that we're uniquely positioned uh, to be uh, an economic engine for the, for the country and for North America. We're going to talk about tourism a little bit later, but I want to continue on some of the issues. And you said you have an aging population. Um, uh, I, I can be honest, I, I, I've been to St. John's once and it was, I didn't stop. I drove through because I was on my way up to St. Anthony's, the tip of Newfoundland. And how are you attracting new residents to your community? Because you painted a vibrant picture of a beautiful bustling downtown, a great arts and culture uh, sector. How are you yeah. attracting residents to your community and new, new, new residents to your St. John's? Yeah, so we've, uh, you know, we have a very, uh, a, a very um, uh, robust downtown. Um, we have uh, people that, uh, that come here to work, uh, that like to live in, in the downtown setting. You know, if you're in downtown St. John's, you can be in a fishing village, a working fishing village in a 10 minute walk. 
uh, you can be up on Signal Hill uh, in uh, uh, where the first wireless uh, transatlantic message was received in in a, in a, in a walk and a, and a beautiful hiking area. We have trails. We have all the amenities. So particularly now, uh, when we're attracting people who can pretty much work anywhere they want in the world, um, they uh, that this is a place to be. We're we're safe. We're relatively safe. Uh, we have uh, clean air. Um, so we have a lot a lot to offer. So what we need to do is we need to grow the industry base so that we can those things are what attracts the people to live here. It's not just coming for the job. They're coming for the lifestyle, and that's what we we can offer. What, what makes St. John so unique to offer that? Because uh, we've heard that, I've heard that uh, from many mayors that we have lots to offer, especially in this pandemic, we, you can work for anywhere. What makes St. John so unique? And it, it's actually a question I was going to ask later, but I'm going to throw it in right now. It, it's the people. Uh, it, is, it is our welcoming uh, uh, people. We, uh, we, we love to uh, entertain. Uh, you can walk down Water Street or George Street uh, any any day, and you can hear somebody playing a musical instrument in in the, the bar. Uh, you can be downtown and and ask somebody for help, and not only will they give you directions, they'll probably take you there if they have uh, the opportunity to do it. Uh, you know, there's just so many stories of that, and we, uh, you know, we're considered one of the happiest uh, communities in Canada uh, according to a StatsCan survey. And the reason why is people feel that if times are tough, somebody has their back. So they they feel that sense of community that we have, and uh, that's the way is um, uh, that's the way people feel about it. Strategic Steps works with local municipalities, boards, and school divisions across Canada, providing guidance and expertise in governance, strategy, and sustainability. They work with clients to build on existing strengths, develop recommendations that are practical, sustainable, and strategic, and lead professional development sessions that drive organizational excellence and council and board member growth. From strategic planning to organizational and governance reviews to governance workshops and more, Strategic Steps has the tools, experience, and expertise to help your organization reach its goals and set itself up for future success. To book a consultation or learn more about Strategic Steps Incorporated, visit strategicsteps.ca today. I want to I want to ask about the tax base here because you, you're right. Um, revenue is about seventy five percent of that property taxes, and, and that is just the value of the land. That doesn't mean that everyone is able to pay that because they are okay. struggling right now because we had some challenges over the last few years. How is the city going to be able to manage this over the next few years? Because this is going to be a domino effect if if it isn't dealt with correctly right now. And as mayor, people are looking to you to say, OK, you need to guide us through this challenging economic time. And while we would love to help and pay our pay our taxes right now, we can't because I've lost my job. I haven't been able to get back to where I was before the pandemic. Yeah. So, you know, one, one of our big, um, uh, the cornerstones of our strategic plan is sustainability. And uh, when people look at sustainability, they tend to think of climate change and they tend to think of the environment. But economic sustainability is, is, is a critical uh, piece of, of how the city operates. It comes from efficiency. It comes from being able uh, to manage your, um, fiscally manage uh, your, your, your situation uh, so that you alleviate much of the burden from taxpayers as much as possible. So when we come to capital projects, for example, when we borrow for capital projects, we try our best and are very successful at only borrowing for cost-sharing projects. So we, we have to have a balanced budget. So it's, it's important that we keep our percentage of revenue that we're spending on debt servicing at a minimum. Right now, we're at about 15% or 14%, which is very good. Uh, but that takes um, uh, that, that takes very strong fiscal discipline. And it means that it also means that the choices we make sometimes are not that 
popular because people want to get there quicker. Uh, but ours is going to be a longer, uh, a longer term, term play there. But we, um, you know, we. So how are, do you pick are, and choose? Working how there. do you pick and choose what infrastructure projects are the priority because that strategic plan and it is a key document that all municipalities have but i've heard municipalities who write a strategic plan they don't look at it anymore because yeah. of the pandemic and it's been a complete gong show for the last few years how do you pick and choose how does the city of st john say okay you know what we had the strategic plan but right now that's completely out the window because we are in an unprecedented time and we don't know how that is going to affect our bottom dollar and the choices that we have to make because when we made it, it wasn't a pandemic. Yeah, so so we have four pillars. We have the, the pillars of being a, a city that moves, a connected city, um, an efficient city, and a sustainable city. That's our four pillars. So everything we do- I love that you uh, can just com- ramble those off. I, I love that a mayor <laughs> can actually talk about them because not a lot can. <laughs> Yeah. So, so those four issues, we look at everything in that lens of whether this this supports our strategic plan of where where we want to go. Uh, many of the issues that we have, uh, you know, you you have when you're looking at road work, for example. One thing we do is the staff come in and give us their um, their advice on the road work for this year. List the streets that are going to be done. What work's going to be done. We, we look at it, we approve it, but we don't get into saying, oh, no, you need to do this one before that one, right? So basically, the list that comes in is the list that gets produced unless there's an emergency where it's got to, where it has to change. But that's something that we, if you go by your priorities, if you empower your staff to make their priorities and bring them to you, then you can stay on that track. I think sometimes where politicians go wrong is trying to manage that. And it's it's not something you can manage. You can manage it big picture, but not necessarily down to the minutia. How is the relationship between council and administration? Because for those who don't know, and I say this with respect, um, the CAO is the only staff member that council can direct. They can't go and talk to the communications person. They can't go talk to the IT person or the operations worker who's on the road and saying, you need to go fix this puddle. You're talking to the CAO. So when I say administration, I ultimately mean the CAO. So how, 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 uh, 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 how much of a need is there to have a good working relationship with your CAO as mayor? It's critical. And, and the same with the senior staff, you have to have trust. You have to trust that the decisions they're making are, are in the best interests of the city and that they're well thought out and, uh, and the execution plan is put in place. Uh, we have a tremendous staff um, that uh, works day in, day out tirelessly. Uh, for uh, for the residents and no issues. One of the things that people don't understand as well is that the mayor has no particular power. Uh, the mayor signs documents. The mayor signs big checks. Uh, this, this side <laughs> represents the city at events, uh, but he is really the fir- he or she is the first amongst equals. And I have one vote like like everybody else. I have influence. But um, in terms of having additional power, there's no additional power uh, in St. John's in the seat of the mayor. People find that hard sometimes. People say, uh, you should be able to do that. You should be able to tell them to come down and fix my uh, that hole in front of my driveway right now. No, we got a system that does that. And uh, we, we, we abide by the system. Did you know that going into the role? Because you were uh, elected councillor for two terms. And then as mayor, it's a new perspective because like you said, you are the figurehead of the council and yeah. people are now looking at you saying, okay, this new guy's going to be coming in and he's going to be able to fix all my issues. Not like the last mayor or the mayor after him, but you're going to be able to fix all my issues. So was it a quick understanding for you because you had that municipal experience beforehand? Yeah, and, and also because I'm a bit of a political junkie, I, I follow politics, I follow it, I have a dr- degree in political science, so I, uh, I, I understand uh, how, we, how it all worked, uh, but I've seen some people come in on council with me who didn't have that background and found it very difficult adjusting to the fact that, what do you mean I can't, 
tell somebody to go up and fix or plow that street first. Um, you know, that's the that's the type of thing that they had to come to uh, to grips with. Do you, do you have training sessions in St. John's to deal with that? Because uh, as an yeah. elected official, you get elected and you, uh, I'm not sure about the budget system in, uh, in Newfoundland, but in Alberta and Ontario, you get elected and then you have a budget that you have to pass within like three weeks of getting elected. So yeah. is, is there a training session, like a crash course in municipal yeah. politics for new elected councillors? It's called baptism by fire. And the, 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 <laughs> the, you just... Uh, Pretty much the previous council, we, we have a history of there may be of 11, there might be three or four new people each time. So a vast majority of the council would have been involved in the budget preparations all the way through. Um, so a new new um, uh, councillors coming in. Yeah, they find it they find it a little bit difficult. Um, um, you know, getting into the budget and then realizing the things that they thought they were going to be able to do, it, the money just is not there because probably 80 to 85% of your budget is spoken for before you even start looking at different things, right? You uh, you are about to head into budget session here shortly. Uh, you're, we're coming, we're in October, we're coming up in November. Um, this is the first budget since you've been reelected. That wasn't from the previous uh, budget. Is there things that you're looking at now because of the post-pandemic world that we're living in that you weren't looking at beforehand that you're hoping to get done and accomplished? You know, one of the things that uh, that that we're dealing with right now is inflation. Um, for us, um, you know, the price of a diesel is is a big in our in our transit system. It's about a million and a half a year in increased cost. That's leveled now, so it's a bit more predictable. But what that wasn't predictable going into twenty two. Um, so salt, we use a lot of salt on our roads. We have a lot of freeze and thaw. The price of salt has gone crazy and and every pretty much every project is coming in more expensive than we anticipated it was going to come in so um as well people are feeling the, the pinch we're all feeling the the extra costs in our grocery bills and and other bills that we see so this budget will be one that that tries to hold the line that tries to um re, tries to acknowledge the challenges that people are having on, on a daily basis. So uh, once again, uh, we we tried to get through 21 and we did. We tried to get through 22 and we're doing that. And there's going to be another one of those budgets where we just want to get through this and see what comes out on the other side. I want to, I just want to pr um, mention briefly the affordability issue that a lot of people are facing across Canada right now. Um, in Calgary, we, we are complaining that we're seeing uh, higher than average uh, food prices. Uh, like I said, I've been to St. John's once on my drive through, and I can tell you that the food prices there prior to the pandemic, prior to the inflation crisis that we're in right now, were quite high because you have to ship in a lot of your product. Um, have you seen a more massive increase in prices and how is the city handling this? Because I can imagine any increase right now for a lot of people is uh, the difference between either putting gas in their car, put, like food, putting food on their table or even heating their uh, house during the winter time. And we're coming up to winter. How, how are people surviving right now? You know, it's tough and, and people are, are finding it hard. Rents have gone up. Uh, finding an apartment in St. John's is, is a challenge. Um, you know, if you go now to get a, a, a two liter of milk, I mean, you're going to be playing probably around six dollars uh, for a two liter of milk right now. And, you know, so everything is going up. I and mean, as they go up, of course, it's all inflationary. It, everything else goes goes up with it. Um, so it is challenging, and uh, we've seen an increase, for example, in ridership on transit. It's up uh, each month, it seems to be up around 15, 16 percent uh, because people are, are just leaving their car home and uh, getting a, a bus to work instead of uh, driving their car. So it's, uh, it's a real challenge. It's also a challenge when it comes to collective agreements because. Uh, when you're in uh, negotiating collective agreements, you, you have to recognize that there's inflationary pressures on your employees and you, you need to have a good, strong workforce. Uh, so 
and they've become more challenging too. Does that have a challenge when you're dealing with uh, rural municipalities around St. John's when you're back at the budget table and you're sitting there going, okay, unfortunately, we're going to have to raise our rates to use the uh, the dump or the uh, our water services. And I know it's not going to be the most pleasant thing for our neighbors, but we all have to feel the pinch because we can't rely on our tax base to cover the cost for our neighboring municipalities. Right, so we've, we've done that. And one thing that we do is we pay the same. So if there's a tipping fee at the landfill, uh, that's put into it's kind of like a separate account. It's, <laughs> it's counted for separately, but we pay that tipping fee too. So that's, the, the, that's what we've done. And in, in so that uh, these things are managed, it, the, the money is, is broken out and managed separately, like a different business unit. Um, and then we just bill back what services belong to the city, lawyers, accountants, et cetera, that, uh, that will be used. But, but you're right. I mean, you, you can't increase your revenue at the expense of the, uh, the other municipalities, right? Yeah. So uh, it becomes a real, uh, a real balancing act. But for the most part, we provide excellent services and, uh, you know, top-notch landfill and uh, top-notch water and wastewater facilities and fire department well hello this is your friendly host of the cross-border interviews with chris brown i have some big news for you i am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with strategic steps incorporated to launch a brand new show on october 19th the political trenches local government at work is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments, and we will have a roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the new show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into The Political Trenches. Uh, I appreciate the time you've taken with us so far today. And I have one last small segment. It's my favorite segment of the show. Um, And it's going to be quick. And it's a simple question to you is this. If I was a tourist coming to the city of St. John's tomorrow, if I'm I'm thinking about coming to your community, what are some spots that are the hidden gems of your community that you would highly recommend any tourist go see? You know, Kitty Vitty Village uh, is absolutely magnificent. It's a, it's a small fishing village in the east end of St. John's. Um, it has now a, a microbrewery there. Uh, we have a facility down there. There's a couple of restaurants. Beautiful, uh, beautiful place. Sid Mill Hill, uh, National Historic Site. Uh, the walking trail is just spectacular. It looks over the ocean and over the narrows, the opening the St. John's Harbor. Uh, Cape Spear, uh, just a little bit outside St. John's, is the most easterly point in North America. Um, uh, so when you when you're out there, your next stop is England. So it's uh, it's just a, a an an incredible place. The walking trails through the city. Uh, we have a very very extensive walking trail, the East Coast Trail, uh, which is a bit more rugged. Goes along the shoreline, goes all the way out, and. Uh, you know, there's just so much to see downtown St. John's, the architecture, the music, the, uh, the people. If, if you're coming here and you're here in the summer, uh, we have the regatta, which is the oldest continuous sporting event in North America, 200 and some odd years now. Um, and, and the beauty of it, if you have a second, is that it's weather dependent. So there's a meeting in the morning on the first Wednesday in August. If the weather's good, the committee agrees to go ahead with the regatta for the day. And it's a holiday, and the uh, the regatta and the garden party happens. If it's not a good day, and the committee decides to postpone it till the next day, everybody goes to work. So that announcement's made at six o'clock in the morning. I think is one of the most unique things that we that have is in amazing. St. John's. It is incredible. It's the only holiday that I'm aware of. It's the only, not only the only weather dependent holiday uh, in the British Commonwealth, but it's also the only a statutory holiday that's called by non-elected body. So politicians don't make the holiday. It's the committee that's putting off the regatta. How long has this been going on for us? Sorry, this is a fascinating story. On, I didn't know about this. Yeah, it's going on since I think it's uh, 1818, 200, 203, 204 years. Uh, missed a couple of years during the war and a couple during the pandemic, one during the pandemic. But uh 
Yeah, it's uh, so it's fixed seat rowing. Um, so um, the crews practice uh, from you know all year round, and then uh, they uh, on the first Wednesday in August every year. That's uh, that's regatta day in St. John's. So did it happen this year on the first Wednesday of August? It happened. Beautiful day, huge crowd. We will get probably thirty five to forty thousand people uh, around the lake um, on that day. And, uh, it's, it's, you know, games of chance. It's like a big garden party and, and races. It's just phenomenal. But, um, well, I know what I'm doing this, next August. I know where I'm coming well, look, next August. If, if you, if you come next August, you have that, you have the George street festival and you have the, uh, uh the Newfoundland and Labrador folk festival all, uh, all that summer. And uh, it's St. John's. A, I'm marking in my calendar. Honest. Please do. Um, my last question for you, uh, Your Worship, is this: After a stressful day, after a long council meeting, after just a day that just doesn't go your way, what's the one spot? Is it a park? Is it a walking trail that you go to in the city of St. John's that you can just decompress? You know, I love walking and I uh, walk on the trails here. I don't have one route that I take all the time. I, uh, we do have one. There's one little pond uh, just not far from me that has a walking trail around it that I go regularly, my wife and I. Um, I, also, um, I also play softball. And uh, this is a couple of nights a week, I play in a master softball league. And, you know, it's it's... The one time when you go out there, uh, you're you know you take a bit of ribbing from your from your teammates and that, but it's a time where you can just shut everything out and just enjoy yourself doing something that you've done all your life, um, and uh, that to me is the couple of nights a week that uh, that that gives me uh, for a couple of hours a night uh, a break and then a chance after to to have a a, a glass of pop and uh, and uh, talk to the talk to the boys and. They give you their thoughts too. Uh, there is no <laughs> doubt about that. But uh, those are the types of things. And also playing with my grandkids. They live uh, out of town and they, uh, when they come in, I make sure that I spend a lot of time with them. Well, Your Worship, I want to thank you so much for sitting down for the last 40 minutes and doing this. It's been an honor, a pleasure. And I've learned so much about your community and how much a non-elected official can change the direction of a holiday in your city. So thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it immensely. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your social media feed for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy, helps our society, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We will be back tomorrow with the mayor of Halifax, Mike Savage. We will be back. This has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. And remember, everyone, keep talking. 